This is the Classic Auto Mall Show. Broadcast from the studios inside the Classic Auto Mall in Morgantown, Pennsylvania. Just one hour west of Philadelphia at Pennsylvania Turnpike Exit 298. Featuring nearly 1,000 classic, vintage, and barn find vehicles for sale under one climate-controlled roof. Now, here's your host, Classic Auto Mall President and the man with all the toys, Stuart Howden. And welcome to the show, uh, show number 167. Congratulations. <clears throat> is that some kind of milestone? Is I don't there, think so. Is there? Is it like, is that wood or silver the anniversary? No, anniversary? but every week is a, is a is an anniversary. All right, before we get to our guests, one quick thing. We have to, we should change our recording because now we're over. Yep. Well, so how many cars in inventory? Well, I heard, I, I cheated. <laughs> JR, you can guess then. Come on. Let's uh, 1,028. I was, uh, I know it was. You're weak. 1,066. Oh, gosh. Oh, well. I got to pay more attention to you, yeah, Stuart. Yeah, pay more attention. I and know. Keep, a, keep an eye on you what's coming at. and going. Yeah, that I good know. stuff. So I don't want to get yelled at. <laughs> well, I don't do much yelling. If I do yell, everybody should clear the building. Because <laughs> mm-hmm. no, nothing worse than when the little guy gets mad. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, thanks for joining us on the show. And uh, welcome our special guest via Zoom, Mr. Bob Varsha, uh, broadcast journalist, commentator, television personality, public speaker attorney um you got a lot of you wear a lot of hats <laughs> i didn't I have that. over the years thank you Stuart. <laughs> thanks Good for being be- with you yeah uh, i'm not an attorney anymore please you know the old <laughs> saying i wouldn't i wouldn't uh any man who's his own attorney is is a fool yeah. and that would definitely apply to me so <laughs> i understand uh, no, i gave that up years and years ago so you uh and you're originally from not from atlanta where you live now but you're originally from where I grew up on Long Island, just outside New York City in the uh, legendary Burbs. Sure. Um, yeah, were I had you, a good time. Were went you to a, college in New England and then came to Atlanta. So you went to college and education of, uh, was a Bachelor of Arts in Foreign Language uh, from mm-hmm. Dartmouth, which is the normal path to motorsports broadcasting, right? Is that <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> that and the attorney. Uh, right. Yeah. Yeah. The, uh, the cradle of great... Uh, Motorsports broadcasters, Northport, New York. (laughs) Although, actually, I can't I can't laugh about that because we have a little enclave of racing drivers here in Atlanta. Andy Lally is probably the winningest driver in the history of uh, Watkins Glen International. Wow. Andy is from my hometown, went to my high school. Um, And there are several other drivers, mostly who stayed in the Northeast, Mm -hmm. racing modifieds and things like that. Sure. Um, So, you know, I'm not entirely divorced from motorsports (laughs) before I migrated south well i mean you're probably arguably one of the most known voices in broadcasting i read somewhere that somebody said this guy was built for broadcasting (laughs) now (laughs) did you always know that you had a a unique voice that that uh, would resonate with people or did you how did you figure that out or how did you learn that um that's a great question i don't think i learned it a lot of it was uh environment and not education when I was a, a young teenager, about 13 years old, I visited relatives in California, and then I did so again in my uh, freshman year of college, which would have been uh, obviously about five, six years later. And they said, what happened to your accent? And I said, what accent? So well, you came here as a teenager. You were you were a New Yorker. You were from the <laughs> island. You talked like this all the time. Right. And somehow that went away, and I wound up with what I'm told is a pretty neutral accent. I have no idea how that <laughs> happened. But anyway. Um, uh, I, you know, I can only thank my parents for sure. the voice that I have. I, I, I often talk about my career in terms of pure serendipity. I mean, I had no intention of getting involved in motorsports or broadcasting. Uh, I got my law degree here at Emory University in Atlanta, and I'd started out. I was practicing for about four years in different capacities, but I was also a runner in college, sure. and I continued doing that on a recreational basis after college and. And got better at it as I got older and stronger. And I went to the U.S. Olympic trials on a couple of occasions. I was an alternate for the 76 team in the marathon for the Montreal Games. Uh, And I was the president of the local track club. Um, So one year, out of the blue, uh, a local TV station asked if I would help as a a commentator on their broadcast of our big annual event, the July 4th Peachtree Road Race 
which nowadays we get about 65,000 people wow. running a 10K through the streets of Atlanta on a hot <laughs> July morning. Nice. Sounds like fun. <laughs> yeah, I, that speaks to our uh, our courage, uh, if not our intelligence here among the Atlanta running community. But sure. anyway, um, after that experience, a year or two later, the folks at Turner Broadcasting, which was based right. here and mm-hmm. to some extent still is, asked me to do that for them. And then after that, they asked, would you like a job doing news and sports and what was a very small company at that time. So next thing I know, I'm I'm flying off to Korea to inaugurate the uh, the facilities for the Olympic Games in Seoul. Um, I did some CNN news uh, briefs as a part of, I should say, a terrific sports department, right. including guys like Keith Olbermann and sure. Dan Patrick You're and right. Kathleen Sullivan. And the list went on and on. So, you know, I always seem to find myself in a good place at the right time. Turner was a non-union shop, right. so I could do anything. You know, nobody's going to slap my hand if I touched a, a tape machine. Um, and then, um, you know, gradually was at the racetracks working for an independent production company called World Sports Enterprises, right. which was founded by the legendary Ken Squire. Sure, it was uh, great. Oh. NASCAR Hall of Fame, oh. yeah. Um, sent to the racetrack. Met people from another young company called ESPN, and they said, "Hey, why don't you come over here and and call some races for us?" And I said, "Fine." And next thing you know, I was working there full time, and wow. one thing led to another. And I'm not going to do a dramatic reading of my resume here, but um, it, it, you know, I got my hand in the air, and that's sure. what I tell young people all the time: saying, "Okay, I got a degree in film and television. Now what do I do?" Yeah, it's just get your hand in the air, get out and get in front of people, whatever it's it takes. Harder than them. Yeah. That, whatever it takes. Yeah. Exactly. Well, and I think it, I you almost, if you have to, I've heard this from, from famous musicians that almost, if you have to ask how to be successful or famous, then you've already missed the boat, so to speak right. from there. So. Yeah. Well, I was going to say, people ask me from time to time, do you regret having gone to law school and practice law for those four or so years? Uh, and I say, no, because what I like to do is tell stories. And that, to me, is a form of advocacy. You, uh, you know, you take a position, you tell a story, and you research things, and that sort of stuff. All the stuff I learned in law school, um, well, maybe not everything, but <laughs> most of the things I sure. learned in law school, I could apply to the, the business of broadcasting and telling stories. So yeah. I don't regret the, uh, the years I spent in law school at all. Yeah, I mean, I, you never, you don't think about law, lawyering as such, but uh, certainly it makes sense. And uh, what, now, were you a car guy all along? I mean, were you a car guy back in high school much or no? No. I mean, like most kids of our generation, I wanted a car right. <laughs> and, I, and I had one. Right. Uh, my little Ford Falcon with a bazillion miles on the odometer and a three speed on the column and all that sort of thing. Nice. Um, but I was not a motorsports fan sure. as such. There was racing on Long Island. And uh, but I wasn't terribly involved in it. No, it wasn't really until uh, somebody paid me to go to the racetrack that I became a motorsports commentator. It's an old story about Graham Hill, who said I uh, I learned to drive at 22. And within a year, I was I was teaching racing techniques based (laughs) on my vast experience. (laughs) And that's kind of what I was doing. You know, I was at at the racetrack saying, "Okay, you know, what's what's happening here? Now, what do I do? But I learned quickly and I had a lot of great mentors like Ken Squire and Chris Economaki and was able to rub shoulders with a lot of, of terrific people. And I was right there on the cusp of the Internet, which right. was huge when you suddenly had at your fingertips mm-hmm. everything you could possibly want to know about anything. So that helped a great deal as well. Did 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 your job become your passion as well too? I mean, did did motorsport did you have an aha moment where you said, Oh, I really <laughs> did find my thing? Well, you know, um, you're not trying hard enough in this business if you're not fired at least once. And I've been through that a few times. And that's when you realize, you know, you don't know what you've got till it's gone. I thought, well, hey, I want to keep doing this. Sure. And fortunately, I was able to with some ease, having uh, gotten to know a lot of uh, key people in the business. Um, so, yeah, it became my passion and it remains so. Uh, I tell people, you know, if you don't get excited when the uh, when the music plays and you're about to go on air, then it's time to get out of the business. Exactly right. Um, and I, as I said earlier, I like to tell stories and sports generally, motorsports in particular, to me is full of great stories. Uh, sadly, most of which we don't have time to get to air. Uh, yeah. But there's always a ready supply if we have a you know, a rain delay or something at the racetrack. Mm-hmm. And, 
some reason to uh, to talk about racing and all of its you know breadth and depth. Yeah, and I think do you do you have the same feeling that a lot of us do that the glory days of racing are not now? They were you know twenty years ago or whatever. You know, Harry Harry Hurst, our friend, has a great. Uh, 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 YouTube or not YouTube Facebook site that's called Glory Days uh -huh. of Racing, mm -hmm. and uh, you know we always wonder what were the glory days? Was it the you know the smells, the characters, the you know the sounds? I mean things are a little bit more generic today maybe than they were at Road Atlanta in the late seventies with the Camel GT. Right. Well, things are definitely very different, much more professional. The stakes are higher, more money, um, but you know. You can't have history until something happens. So I tend to look at everything that happens as I go along and think, well, you know, this is going to be part of history someday. Sure. Um, so, you know, it, it's like the argument about, you know, which form of racing is better or which driver was better than that guy 50 years ago. You know, it, it's apples and oranges. Sure. And, uh, you know, as I say, there's great stories all the time. And I just try to take them as they come. Well, and and Ken Squire, I mean, he was, you know, what a great mentor. And and Chris Economaki, mm -hmm. you mentioned Dave Despain, who's a right. great, unique voice as well, too. Uh, Jim McKay, Bob Jenkins, Yates. I mean, yep. there's a there's a long list of guys. And, and of course, I think that people say, you know, there's romanticism about the old days that, you know, all of us, like I'm in my 60s, that I, you know, mm -hmm. romanticize about the old days. But I get just as much enjoyment watching Formula One at 4 a.m. today as I did 25 years ago. So, Yeah, absolutely. And I do, too. Uh, you know, without putting anybody down in the past, right. you know, there were the wild and crazy days of the past. And, and we're losing a lot of that, sadly, with the passing of guys like Bobby Allison just sure. recently. Yeah. Um, you know, and that's, that's a shame. Mike Joy and I often sit and have a couple of beverages. And the next thing we're saying is, you know, we, we got to interview everybody from these days. We got to document all this stuff. Right. We have it there. I can tell you from my earliest years in racing, when one of my uh, assignments at world sports, we did the show motor week illustrated, right. which was the first sort of anthology or news show about racing. I was assigned the task of building little historic vignettes for Ken Squire to voice. I had a sponsor and everything. That was right. a big deal. Wow. Um, we called it Ken Squire's Scrapbook. And so I went searching for any existing video of, of key moments in motorsports history. And I found out it was a very difficult process simply because nobody was, nobody was doing it. Nobody had sure. been taking film or video. Certainly... To a certain degree, the, the manufacturers, the OEMs, uh, to a large extent, um, contributing businesses like Champion Spark Plugs or, you know, whatever it was, they might do some some um, historical uh, documentation uh, in video. Um, but there was so little of it. I thought it was really a shame that racing was ignoring this. Now, in more recent times, NASCAR in particular has gotten much more careful about gathering up all these old film and video sources mm -hmm. and cataloging them. And a, and a great friend of mine from early in my career named Ken Martin um, works for NASCAR as a, uh, as an historian wow. and archivist. That's, that's so, great. Yeah, I think it would really be useful if, if every organization in motorsports had someone specifically in charge of doing that, gathering up this stuff. Um, there are enormous private troves of, video out there libraries sure. if you will uh that people have these things need to be found like the great car collections these Absolutely. things need to be found and and brought to enthusiasts everywhere just as important of the cars is the the information about the cars and the history of the cars and the Simeon the Simeon museum has an amazing library and IMMR mm -hmm. I I think I put too many m's in there the IMMR motor racing uh, the one in Watkins Glen <laughs> yeah Watkins Glen uh, yeah. right they the have National an, <laughs> motorsports uh, research center yeah. <laughs> you're close enough yeah that's great um uh great people and and of course then in mm -hmm. Daytona they've got the, the you know the archives there and you know the, the the one thing i miss in the old days is what these automotive channels are not today and they're not the speed channel I remember watching the speed channel so we could see the 1957 monaco grand prix yeah oh there you hey i love that <laughs> you know i miss the speed channel bad <laughs> you was, and a lot of folks yeah. do i do in particular uh and not just because i was getting my uh, <laughs> making my living there sure um they had a phrase early in their marketing campaign that I've always enjoyed, which is speed or um, speed vision, as it was originally called, was the tribal campfire 
for automotive enthusiasts everywhere. I thought that was a great line, and it's exactly what it was. It was diverse. It had that historical bent that I like so much. Um, Great personalities, Dave Despain, Mm -hmm. Alan DeCadene, and and on and on and on, Benny Phillips, and, you know, from across the board, from NASCAR, Mm -hmm. from European sports cars, and world endurance, and drag racing, and motorcycles, and on and on and on. It's, um, It's very much missed, and I was very unhappy uh, when Fox decided that it wanted to make something different out of it, an right. ESPN fighter with all of these different uh, sports. So I stayed with the motorsports side and, and we're still trucking. I think motorsports has kind of a roller coaster relationship with the TV networks. Uh, right. You know, it's, you see a lot of racing on TV when the networks are in love with motorsports and then it dips in popularity and then it comes back and, Right now, I think we're in an area of increasing interest and enthusiasm for motorsports, mainly forced by Formula One and its explosive Absolutely. growth and popularity. So, uh, you know, there's some good days ahead for people sure. who just like to sit back and watch it on TV. Right. Drive to Survive did wonderful things for it, and it yep. was a great mm-hmm. thing. And Will Buxton, uh, you know, made a great little career there out of that. I say little career. I didn't mean that demeaningly. I mean, he, <laughs> he made a great career out of it. <laughs> He's got a great career going on. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. See Will from time to time. Yeah. But- Listen, of a gun. Yeah, doggone it. Why didn't I think of that? You know, uh, anyway, when we, we yeah. when we return, we're going to take a quick break. When we return, uh, we'll continue our conversation with Bob Varsha from uh, via Zoom. We'll catch you on the Classic Auto Mall show in just a couple of minutes. The Classic Auto Mall has more than 1,000 vehicles for consignment in our huge 8-acre climate-controlled showroom. It's a real indoor mall. If you'd like to know all the advantages of buying and selling a car through consignment, the information is available on our website, or you can talk to a classic car specialist who can answer all your questions. It's easy, safe, convenient, and it doesn't matter where you are, we sell worldwide. See our huge selection of classic and collectible vehicles at ClassicAutoMall.com. And we're back with the Classic Auto Mall show from the Classic Auto Mall studio. I love that generic music that you find, JR. And now the other, <laughs> the lead in was Pat Travers of Great Band, who I loved. And I got to see actually in Atlanta at the, at, uh, at uh, Road Atlanta. They did a festival okay. concert back in 1978. And it was Pat Travers and Ted Nugent. And I don't oh, know. Oh, wow. Yeah, it was, you know, it was highfalutin stuff when you're from Knoxville, Tennessee, going down to the big city of Atlanta. So. Sure. <laughs> the good old days. You know, we were talking about the Speed Channel before we went to break. Um I've heard there's a resurrection going on. Is that still in the works? Have you heard anything about that? Or can that maybe there's a possibility that there'll be a speed vision like it was before? Well, I don't know how much it's going to resemble the old speed vision, but a lot of the key people involved in that, including including Roger Werner, who right. is a former president of ESPN and a founder of uh, speed vision, has been working with um, my friends Ralph Shaheen and Joe Tripp and the gang at uh, Speed Sport. You know, they bought up Chris Economaki's old uh, old imprint. And right. now they do a totally online news uh, event uh, site. And they've launched uh, Speed Sport TV, which is accumulating um, lots of rights to live events that Roger specialized in. Um, and yeah, they're basically creating uh, something very much like speed vision sure and uh, i wish them all the best it's a free streaming service i don't know whether you have roku or fire fox right. or you know bell south or whatever <laughs> all these streaming that's services dating are. you bell south now <laughs> yeah. check well i am in atlanta yes true um, yeah but you can check out uh, speed sport tv and uh, and see what they're offering right now it's only about a year or so old right um but, you know, they're doing a great job, and sure. I'm, I'm all for it. Hopefully well, I can get some work out of them. Yeah, yeah. Well, we're hoping to see Wayne Carini back on with his show, and I've heard rumor that he is either going to be on there or has been on there or in the yes. future. So I spoke with Wayne about that. He's actually got a deal to do multiple themed shows, I think. It's awesome. not just going to be chasing classic cars. He's sure. got some other things going on. He's he's a really creative guy. Oh, my goodness. He really is. And and that show is so refreshing to me because, listen, n- not to put down all the other shows, but they're all based on deadlines and builds. And there's so much more to the hobby than that. There are so many, oh, yeah. you know, more yeah. stories and, and interesting things to talk about. Uh, yeah. I'm not crazy about those car shows if we can call them that that are basically showcases for tools and equipment (laughs) or it's based on all of this you know faux drama and guys throwing wrenches at each other and 
showing off their tattoos and their wild beards and all that kind of right. stuff. Present company accepted. Right. Um, <laughs> yeah, this is just a mild beard. <laughs> yeah, I just, it shows like shows like Wayne's that are, you know, they're about cars. And, you know, we came across this car and here's why we think it's valuable or took it to the shop. And here's what we found when we took it apart and put it back right. together. And, yeah, it's, those are good fun. Yeah. And and we're seeing, you know, what what uh, Justin and Tommy have done with Torque uh, with Pebble Beach is is mm -hmm. make it more. Uh, the first few versions were a little wobbly and then it just got great. And then the last year was, yeah. or this year was really good because it became I hate to use this term, more Barrett Jackson ish. The car comes up, you kind of talk about the car, the interesting history of the car. You know, right. that seems to be a, a better focal point than to just talk to a bunch of random people that are kind of famous or whatever uh, in our yeah. world. And I thought that that was interesting because Barrett Jackson has become quite educational in, as opposed to enter and, and entertaining. Yeah, it's both. And all credit to Craig Jackson and his people for developing that idea uh, that uh, great car auctions are not snooty. They are not restricted to people with, you know, gazillions of dollars to spend. There's all kinds of cars. One of the first Barrett Jacksons I did back at the, the turn of the millennium. Right. <laughs> um, uh, I'm a big Mercedes fan. And um, they had a, a beautiful low miles silver Mercedes sedan. And it went for like ten or eleven thousand dollars. And I'm sitting there thinking, well, uh, yeah, I. I if I'd only known, um, and you see those kind of buys all the time. In addition to the, you know, the the spectacular multi million dollar sales of really interesting machines and everything in between, and sure. that's why I'm fascinated by uh, by the big car auctions. I've done Barrett Jackson on and off for for two decades now. Uh, I just recently got back from the fourth GAA I saw that. Classics at mm -hmm. the Palace mm -hmm. in Greensboro, North Carolina, which is a terrific show. Much smaller, really? yeah. about 750 cars, if you can believe it. Yeah, Fabulous uh, arena that Dean Green has built oh, for his show there. Magnificent. We air it on Map TV. Yeah, it's great people watching. It's just just big fun. Sure. And I, I really enjoy that. I'd miss it if it went away. Yeah, me too. Dean Green did a great job of starting kind of late to the to the party, uh, but said, mm -hmm. okay, we're going to make this thing so cool. And the the skyboxes and the food and the building. Yep. Now he's got, his building is almost, as, it may be as big as ours, I think now, uh, 300 and something thousand square feet. 355,000 yeah, square feet. We're, we're a paltry 336, so, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I've got to look you guys up. The you gotta, idea of a thousand cars yeah. up there by the uh, turnpike, I want to have a look. Yeah, we're, we're kind of like the Barrett Jackson, Meekum, GAA. We got a little bit of everything. We got $5,000 yeah. El Caminos, and we got a million dollar Cobra, and we got everything in between. And, of yeah. course, you know, that's, that's the kind of stuff that we know that, would it, yeah, would I love to have it full of Ferraris and Silver Arrow, Mercedes, and of course, but <laughs> but it's not a viable business model for a thousand cars. Uh, number one and number right, two, right. we want to we want to start everybody out in the hobby. You know, there's a reason that Chevrolet sells you a Spark for nineteen grand, and then one day they hope to sell you a Suburban for ninety grand or whatever. You know, they they mm -hmm. they and we're we kind of do that with our clients. You know, a guy starts out buys something cheap, works his way up. So. Sure. I mean, that that's the whole idea of the car hobby. Sure. You know, you just get interested. We we're talking about wine during the break. You yeah. and I, you, you drink what you like. And so you shop for a car that you like. Right. You know? Yeah. That's, I, you get a uh, you get a classic inline six cylinder three on the tree, 1967 Plymouth Valiant with a vinyl roof. <laughs> Let me know. I'm sure we've had we hell. We may even have one. I don't know. <laughs> it's hard to keep up with everything. People say, do you have any Thunderbirds? I go, I'm quite certain we do. Right. <laughs> I don't know how many. You want twelve of them? <laughs> yeah, we got twelve. Out. We can do a package deal. So, right. you know, but but the but it's interesting that that for Barrett Jackson doing the all no mm -hmm. reserve format really is what kind of I think sparked the movement within watching yes. it on TV because you weren't right. going to see a bunch of no sales that some auctions even the best auctions you know meek them you can mm -hmm. go and there could be a run of ten no sales uh, it yep. just it it just happens and and Barrett you know in in deference to them and what they did it was amazing to mm -hmm. get people to say i'm going to give you my cars and whatever it brings is what it brings yep what a great that's business the deal model. yeah well yeah and concurrent with that i think they brought up the idea of nationwide television so right. folks out there could see what's there and look at the catalog online ahead of time and look for their car 
and follow it on the website and bid online, bid by telephone, bid by proxy. You know, if you wanted something from the Barrett Jackson catalog, you could have it. You just had to work a little bit. It sure. Could, it could happen. Yeah. Uh, and I credit Craig Jackson and his crew for that as well. Bringing not only bringing it to the people uh, throughout the economic spectrum, but by also putting that on TV yeah. so that everybody could join in. Well, I guarantee you, Dana Meekham would be the first to tell you that television did everything in the world for his business. And there's no question about Absolutely. it. I mean, what he's built is uh, a Goliath. Yeah. I mean, it's it's quite unbelievable. They'll have 4,000 cars in Kissimmee in January, including the Steve no McQueen uh, Gulf livery. So, you know, it'll, and I don't know what all the history is, but we'll have, we're going to have um, uh, Jay Gelati, who is the 917 uh-huh. expert. And we're going to talk about that car and he's going to tell us all about it and why it's going to be so special and bring a gazillion dollars. Um, yeah. You know, it's, it's funny though. A lot of people became what amazes me at Bear Jackson is not to to keep on them, but but is the fact that these guys on the fantasy bid can pick a bid for a car that there is no real price guide or basis. You know, it's not like a 2018 Camry, you know, that you right. know exactly what it's worth or within two or three hundred dollars. How do those guys right. do the fantasy bid and get so close and do so well? Are they psychic? I mean, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> well, um, possibly. Um, <laughs> but no, I think it's uh, it's a product of the kind of things we've been talking about. You know, it's research, it's interest that may go back many, many years. Um, and um, and a lot of just plain old luck. Yeah, you know? uh, true. I, yeah, it's like the casino. I mean, we were talking about that. Yeah. You know, you just walk in there and it, either it's your day or it ain't, you know. <laughs> right. Yeah. It's just another element of fun in well, the whole equation. Well, and, and you know, doing obviously what you love. I'm doing what I love. I mean, that's that's so cool that, you know, you're able to do that. I mean, listening to you and uh, David Hobbs, who we had on the show, and Steve Matchett, I thought you guys, uh-huh. the trio, were the the as good as it gets. I mean, even better than Murray Walker and James Hunt. <laughs> well, I appreciate that very much. Yeah. Uh, we are very different than Murray Walker and James Hunt. <laughs> yes. uh, but um, yeah, those were great days. Yeah. Uh, and throw Sam Posey into that mix, oh, and Peter sure. Windsor, and on and on and on. Um, I will admit that I, I jumped in front of ESPN, my old employer, uh, as soon as I knew that um, Liberty Media was bringing its Formula One broadcast to uh, ESPN. Right which apparently didn't want them. So it was given to them for free. That's not the case anymore. Oh, sure. <laughs> but, you know, my view was, you know, hey, let's let's get the band back together. You know, right. it, familiar voices. Uh, I'd say American voices, but uh, David and Steve are obviously Brits. But right. they're, you know, they're they're so familiar to the American right. fans. Right. Um, I think it would have been great fun. Yeah. And in fact, I'm going to an ESPN function tomorrow um, to make my case once again until they throw me out. <laughs> Um, I like your persistence. Uh, thank you. Yes, uh, yes. But, yeah, those were great days with those guys. Well, you all three had distinct voices. You knew exactly who was talking <laughs> at any given moment, whereas that's not always the case in in certain broadcasting things. And of course, uh, and and if you if you can join us for one more segment, I'd love to talk to you a little bit about uh, some more about Formula One and things that are going on in the market. If you got a few minutes to kill. Absolutely. Right. I ain't playing golf this morning, so <laughs> off we go. All right. We'll be back with the Classic Automall Show in just a couple of minutes. See you then. Whether you want to buy or sell a classic, collectible, or special interest vehicle, you need to visit the Classic Auto Mall website for more information. If you're looking to buy, you can easily search our inventory of more than 1,000 vehicles on the web at ClassicAutomall.com. I think I could play that bass lick right there, and I have no musical talent whatsoever, but I could do that little lick. <laughs> I, I thought bass playing, does that look like the easiest instrument to play in a rock band? Well, they all look easy. <laughs> well, You're right. the lead singer probably looks easy. Anyway, joining us back in cool. via Zoom is uh, Bob Varsha speaking to us uh, via Atlanta, so at least you're in the same time zone as us, so that's a good thing, so we didn't get you up at the Absolutely. crack of dawn. Mm-hmm. You know, there's nothing worse than realizing that you're calling a guy and you go, oh, it's 7.30 and I'm calling a guy and he's on the <laughs> West Coast. <laughs> Whoops, it's three thirty there. What are you doing? Uh, mow, mowing the yard? <laughs> right. Been there, done that. Yeah, we've I all done call a, I had to call an athlete about that peach tree road race that right. I described earlier. Make sure this elite athlete was coming to town. And I called uh you know late in the morning my time and this woman's voice answers, Hello <laughs> uh, I, hi, here's who I am and here's why I'm calling she said, Well he's asleep right now. It's six thirty in the morning here. 
Oh, okay. Thank you very much. Yeah. I'll remember that. Well, you know, and the Formula One should remember that from us because I'm damn tired of getting up at 1 a.m. The Vegas race, I got to get up <laughs> at 1 a.m. to watch now. I don't know how. Yeah. I, I don't, I'm in a conundrum. I used to be able to stay up late. Now I may mm-hmm. have to get up early. I don't know. I'm I'm on the fence of what to do now. <laughs> maybe just record it and we'll yeah, watch maybe it, so. Watch it a little later. You know, when you first started in and doing the F1, you were doing it remotely. You were in Connecticut, right? And covering the races. Actually, no. Actually, my first race was uh, Austria in 1987. Wow. Uh, my my predecessor as the host on ESPN was Sir Jackie Stewart. <laughs> Wow. Um, and Jackie, I think it's fair to say Jackie was used to the ABC Sports, uh, you know, network in its glorious prime when nothing was too expensive, build right. it, buy it, invent it, whatever you needed to do. Um, and he got real tired of the cable TV way of doing things budget wise right. early on. So whatever reason, because he either couldn't or didn't want to go to Austria for the Grand Prix, I got a call. Uh, from my boss at ESPN, say, can you, you know, go to Austria and host this Grand Prix for us? Sure. Thought, well, sure. I mean, I've done 24-hour races with 250 drivers. I mean, 26 cars and drivers for a 90-minute race, piece of cake. Sure. Um, so I go on over and uh, and wind up presiding over the first double red flag <laughs> hit, uh, race in the history of Formula One. All the cars lined up. Down to the first turn, big crash, big right. steaming pile, call it all off, bring everybody back. An hour, hour and a half later, send them off again. Another oh. big steamy crash down at turn one, bring them all back. So it took, I think, almost four hours before we actually <laughs> completed a green flag lap. <laughs> Fortunately, I had Chris Deconomacki as my co commentator there. So that uh, got us a long way. Um, but we actually did go to the event and continued to when I began my full time, right. full season. Uh, schedule with ESPN and David Hobbs right. in uh, 1989. We did that till about 1993 or 94 um, when we stopped doing them by going to the actual site and uh, started doing them remotely. And that kind of turned into, uh, you know, the modus operandi sure. for the entire industry. Was uh, it NBC diff- Yeah. Was it difficult? Does a lot of their stuff from Stanford. Um, different. But not difficult. Right. Uh, fortunately, I'd been doing it for some years at that point. So I'd been to a lot of these places and I could talk about them. You know, every racetrack in the world looks the same from curb to curb. Right. But, you know, it's the it's the, the country you're in or the city you're in. And it's the it's the history and the culture as well as the race itself and the history of the cars, the track and what have you. So, you know, I could riff on that sure. even if you couldn't see it. Right. Um, more recently, when we started uh, doing them from home, it got more difficult as new racetracks came on, like all these Tilka tracks right. in places like um, Indonesia and China. And uh, I mean, my Australian Grand Prix was Adelaide. Right. And even though I did the Australian Grand Prix for many years after that, it was in Melbourne. I'd never been to Melbourne. So mm-hmm. it you know, became a little bit tougher. Sure. But, um, um, yeah, now so much TV sports is done remotely mm-hmm. that uh, Formula One is no. Um, no stranger to that. And it had actually worked in our favor, I think, in 1994 on that horrible weekend at Imolo yeah. where we lost Roland Ratzenberger and yep. Ayrton Senna. We were in Bristol, Connecticut. Um, Derek Daly was my co-commentator. And they shut down. The, the press room in Imola was on lockdown. No information about anything. Wow. But we had the worldwide news gathering resources of ESPN at our disposal there. And we managed to find out, and I think we might have been one of the first to to uh, broadcast the news that Seno, in fact, had passed. Sure. Um, so, you know, there's pluses and minuses. But it helps to know what you're looking at. Well, sure, sure. And, I mean, you know, there's nuances at every track. I mean, uh, you know, you got uh, Interlagos when you have that little turn and going up the hill. And you got, you know, there's right. all, all kinds of cool little things. And, of course, Monaco, hard to believe that that's still even on the calendar. And and not because I, I love it. I think Monaco is awesome. Yeah. Uh, but mm-hmm. I loved what you said about Monaco one time. Monaco is everything Formula One aspires to be. Wealth, fame, and decadence. It's the billionaire's yep. Disneyland. <laughs> yep, absolutely. I got there by uh, uh, I was replacing Keith Jackson, right. the uh, you know the, the the great college football. He was announcer. doing Formula One. He was doing Formula I don't One. Remember that? And he 
He hated the place, <laughs> just loathed it. And he had one of the great all time uh, opening on cameras when they went there. And he talked about how everybody here is a poser <laughs> and everybody here is part you know, criminality and on and on. <laughs> but he got he got sick or again, maybe just decided I don't want to do this. Yeah. So I got called in uh, to ABC. That was my debut on the big network right. as opposed to ESPN. And I was working with Jackie Stewart and John Bisignano. Right. And um, yeah, that was a that was a real adventure. Oh, I can he, imagine. Um, that's when I learned that Sir Jackie Stewart is severely dyslexic because I came into our announce booth and paper the walls with all my information and notes and histories and whatnot. Jackie comes in with a legal pad and a pencil and puts it down. Wow. Blank legal pad. And uh, that's when he started writing notes to himself in a, a very odd sort of wow. stenography based uh, system right. that only he could read because sure. he is so severely dyslexic. Wow. Um, yeah, that was a revelation in lots of different ways. But your sure. point was Monaco, mm -hmm. and and I'm with you. I, I can't imagine Formula One without it, and I like to think Formula One cannot imagine Formula One without it. Yeah, it's a it's a prize fight in a phone booth, or sure. trying to race a bicycle in your living room, as Nelson <laughs> right. Piquet sure. memorably said. But uh, I I actually conduct a lecture cruise on a cruise line called Windstar right. every year. We sail from Barcelona, visit some ports like Cannes and Antibes, and get to Monaco in time for Saturday qualifying Sunday race. Then we sail on to Rome, where we uh, where we end the cruise. And I give talks along the way and PowerPoint slides and videos talking about Monaco, you know, in the way we do a television broadcast because you have totally unsophisticated fans who have no idea no idea what's going to happen. Sure, and you have super sophisticated fans who know more about Formula One than I do. I, uh, which is fine. I want to know how you but, got that gig. That sounds like the best gig <laughs> ever. You well, get to go on a cruise ship and get paid and go to Monaco. I mean, come on. Well, well I don't get paid, but my <laughs> wife and I get flown over there and they give us a stateroom. All, hey. you know, all, all expenses paid. So it's that's, worth the, it. that's the same as getting paid. I think. Absolutely. And I got it. I got it from John Bisignano, who right. had been doing it for a few years. And once again, one of those, he either couldn't or didn't want to do it. He sure. said, how about if I give him your name? I said, let me think about it. Yes. And um, <laughs> and I am now John Bisignano's Wally Pip. You know right. who Wally Pip is? No. no. Well, Wally Pip was the first baseman for the New York Yankees. And one day he couldn't go. And they put in his backup, who was a guy named Lou Gehrig. Right. <laughs> who then, when the Iron Horse went on to play you know a record number of right. consecutive games wow. nobody remembers Wally Pitt, but. <laughs> exactly so i'm gonna see john Vizignano tomorrow night at the cspn reunion function and uh i'll be interested to see <laughs> i mean we've talked about it but sure. the fact that he I wants his gig that, back <laughs> he, he, right exactly i'm sure he does he was great i'd forgotten sorry, about him yeah sorry john i yeah. uh i'd forgotten that as well too i mean we're talking mm -hmm. about Monaco, what Senna won there six times, I believe. Uh, uh, is that right? Five times. Five times. Uh, but okay. I love, uh, you know, no margin for error at, at Monaco, even on my little driving Absolutely. game in my basement. Mm -hmm. You know, you still screw up at Monaco and it's just sure. difficult. But, you know, I loved, uh, I don't know if I loved it. I don't know if the outcome when Senna wrecked Prost and said, being a racing driver means you're racing with other people. And if you no longer go for a gap that exists, you are no longer a racing driver. Uh, well, interesting way to put it, I guess. Max may, Max Verstappen may have that same philosophy too, right? Oh, absolutely. And Michael Schumacher. Sure. Um, you know, they're not saying I'm going to crash you. And there are guys in Formula One history who, who developed that reputation. But anything that is not outlawed in the rule book to them is fair game. Yeah. So, you know, that's their, uh, and that's always the excuse they give. Sure. Um, you know, Michael Schumacher, there were rules developed because of the way he would chop across the his opponent's bow at the start of a race right. or how he would dive down the inside or not give somebody enough room if he were being passed. Um, and he would always say, you know, they, 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 the rule doesn't say I can't do it. So this is the way I race. It should be called the, the rule. Yeah. The smoky eunuch or the uh, junior Johnson rule in formula one. Right. <laughs> well, yeah, I'm sure every motorsport sees its share of it. Mm -hmm. And um, and Max Verstappen said the same thing most recently when we had, uh, you know, the repeated 
running off the road of Lando Norris <laughs> in Mexico City. Right. And then and he was chastised for it with a 20 second penalty. Right. And afterwards, he said, you know, I race by the rules. You don't right. want me to do it. Pass a rule that says I can't a- do it. Absolutely. And then I won't. Well, that's, so. you know, people, eh, it's just like anything. People are going to do what they're supposed to do and what they're told that they can and can't do. And if somebody doesn't tell you you can't do it, then how can that be illegal or whatever? Right, you, you, right. Which is a tight reading of the regulations, but at the same time, the cars have become so safe. Right. And this is a cause of some concern throughout all kinds of motorsports. The cars are so safe that certain drivers aren't afraid to use them as weapons. Sure. And that's evil, yeah. in my view. Well, I mean, you wonder how a guy can come into a turn and one guy can break later than the other guy in basically the same car, the two, uh, you know, the two Williams cars or the two McLarens or the two Mercedes mm-hmm. or... And how can one, is it, is it just fear? Is it, it's hard to figure out what reason one can wait later to break. Well, um, yes. Uh, you know, some are just, you know, late breakers. Others realize this is what I have to do to achieve what I want to in this corner. Other, you know, some cars are better breakers than sure. other. You know, it's all part of the art and science and luck and religion of being a racing driver. Right. As uh, as Senna so rightly said to Jackie Stewart in that famous interview, you mentioned, you know, if you don't do these things, you're not a racing you're driver. A race driver. You, know, you may as well go out on the highway and, you know, use your turn signal to change lanes and all that kind of stuff. Right. Well, I mean, if you look at, I mean, racing is dangerous and it's always going to be dangerous. No matter how much safety features that they yep. add, there's always the, the thrill of, of danger uh, that can happen with it. And of course, you know, Senna, I mean, if you watched him race and you watch those in-car cameras of him, I'm sure the camera magnifies it, but it's still a mm-hmm. lot of, the, 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 I mean, it's like, oh, oh yeah. man. Definitely. Yeah. You it's know. still in, in a very different way, but in a very real way. And in some similar ways, it's such an incredible athletic exercise. And from time to time, you'll hear some, you know, some big newspaper sports writer or something say, well, racing motorsports or, you know, that's not sports. You do it sitting down. I mean, come on. Yeah. If you've ever been in a racing car and the temperature is soaring and you're in a thick fire resistance suit and balaclava and boots and gloves and helmet, and you're flying around at incredible speeds and making microsecond decisions that can have such a huge impact on your race and your health. Sure. Um, you know, don't, don't try to tell me that is not an right. athletic exercise because it absolutely is. If you ever ride with a racing driver and I've ridden right. with a whole bunch, you realize right away that what they're doing is very different from what Hobbs used to call going to the drugstore only faster. No, no, no. <laughs> it's not that at all. Right. And, it's one of my favorite things to do is to to drive with a David Hobbs or a Dick Bell or a Dan Gurney or or any of the guys I've driven with um, and see that you know it's a whole different ball game for yeah. them where they're looking you know how they're using the car it's um yeah it's, it's it's really a science it's amazing to watch the the changes they make on those wheels that they have now and then watching like Justin Bell when he was in his dad's 960 low and brown 962 and having to manually yeah. change the suspension and you know right. while they're driving and but but you know I play our little sim game in our basement and after you know 25 laps I'm exhausted and that's just you know no fear of death well I mean my wife right. can hit me upside the head with a shovel but but right. other than that no fear of death by driving and right. I'm tired you know, I'm like, wow, sure. I'm really a little bit. So you can imagine, like you said, with the uh-huh. heat and all that. Yeah. And focus. Yeah. It's, it's very much an athletic exercise. Uh, any, uh, any thoughts of Gunther Steiner getting his own show or we, we, have he even got his own <laughs> show? <laughs> okay. We're missing him, man. He, he was yeah. the character, wasn't he? Yeah. Gunther, boy, that drive to survive made him a superstar. <laughs> it really did. And, and that's fine. He is, I can tell you, a very different guy in a, you know, interpersonal conversation, right. then he might seem to you on TV. Sure. You know, he's, he, he's not as goofy as he can sometimes seem. Right. He's a lifer. He's been in this business a long time. He knows a great deal. Um, you know, his language <laughs> dexterity or lack thereof <laughs> leads to some funny situations. <clears throat> sure. Excuse me. But he is definitely a sharp cat. Oh and, yeah. Uh, it's great fun to talk to at the racetrack. Do you, um, uh, 
do you for and he's a star yeah mm-hmm. and he's a star and then because of drive to survive i mean that's amazing how that did yeah. and of course mm-hmm. thank god this year that we're getting some diversity in the win category because last year i got to think all these new people coming in are like wait a minute is this what formula one is the same guy wins every week or two weeks or whatever <laughs> it is you know yeah. thank god for that because we've got all this momentum into the u.s and uh mm-hmm. with with three races although you know, three races that are arguably, except for Miami, in the same location we've had them before. Austin was Dallas, and Vegas mm-hmm. had a race, like we were talking yeah. about back at the Caesar's yep. Palace days. Yep. Um, yeah, I mean, I, it used to drive me nuts that people would say, well, Americans don't get Formula One. You know, it's a wine and cheese sport to them. And, <laughs> you know, it's all European, and <clears throat> all the great stars are are euros and so there's uh, no way it, it could succeed in america for any amount of time well hello <laughs> yeah, you know, here we are now with, pretty well with three races yeah um you know part of what was holding back formula one in america was the <clears throat> the administration of bernie ecclestone right who owned the commercial rights before liberty media and had no interest in social media no interest in um broad-based television no interest in, in promoting and on and on and on. But when Liberty brought, you know, modern techniques of communication and marketing and so forth to the table and spent a lot of money on promoting it and ensuring that everybody had a good time at the racetrack, look what we get. Yeah. 400,000 plus people yeah. in consecutive races yeah. at Miami and at Austin. And God knows how big the crowd is going to be for Las Vegas. Yeah. Although be, there aren't quite as many grandstands there. Sure. There's certainly a lot of space to spread out and watch the race. Mexico City, where I was on the PA yeah. for uh, for this past event, was um, another absolutely huge crowd. So right. there's no question that Americans get Formula sure. One, and it is now without question the the biggest worldwide motorsport. And and a lot of it is that diversity you pointed sure. out. I mean, sure. people say, well, you know, IndyCar is the most competitive, and I'm not knocking IndyCar, right? But uh, I saw a note the other day that. In the last 20 years, three teams have won the championship, maybe with different drivers. Right. But if you're not Penske, Ganassi, or Andretti, you're not winning. Yeah. You weren't going to win. Yeah. And they had, what, um, five or six race winners last year. Formula One's had seven or eight this year. This yeah. year. Yeah. Um, you know, there there is diversity and there is good racing in Formula One. And uh, if, you, if you believe those old comments, um, you do yourself a favor and, and check out Formula One these days. I think you'll really be surprised and I, I happy think, with what you see. I think so too. And thoughts on uh, Lewis going to Ferrari? Is that uh, posture? Is that is it going to mean anything? Is is Ferrari going to become more well, successful? <clears throat> As my old colleague Steve Matchett likes to say, every driver wants to be a Ferrari driver, <laughs> well, and I think there's a lot of truth. To sure, that. sure. Um, you know, about Lewis, given the way his season has gone here in his final season with the team that that helped him to seven world championships and most of his 104 race victories sure. now, maybe 103, um, it, it doesn't quite ring true to me that Lewis is going to Ferrari. Yeah, he wants to be a Ferrari driver. Can't blame him for that. Right. Um, but I, I just don't know if Lewis at age 36, 37, when he's at Ferrari, uh, has that spark right. still. Um, of course, it, it's all about the race car. Well, it's and true. his engineer, yeah, he's not bringing Bono. Yeah, um, exactly. Peter Bonington over with him. And that chemistry driver and, and race engineer is so important. Sure. And it's going to be interesting. Yeah. More and, grist for the mill. Yeah. It, I mean, it's interesting because it seems to me Lewis is maybe, I don't know if this is the right word, a little timid when he gets mid-pack and passing people. He doesn't seem to be getting around people maybe he should be getting around. And yeah. I don't know it's if that's you from, should say that. From age Chris Ergonomaki used to say that about Jim Clark right. all the time. Right. You know, if he's out in clear air. <laughs> See ya. Yeah. He's gone. Yeah. But, you know, in that, that sort of wheel to wheel combat, you may find a very different uh, driver. Sure. You know, maybe a little more timid or, or a little more careful. Because God knows when Jim Clark was racing, yeah. a mistake could kill you. Yeah. Yeah. Not, not likely to happen in Formula One these days, but still. Which I'm, um, I'm glad to see, and uh, you know, fun <laughs> to watch uh, the McLaren boys uh, do their thing. <laughs> yep. I tell you that Piastri, he's cool as a cucumber, isn't he? That, that guy's for his yes. age. 
You know, I, yeah. I can't imagine being that disciplined at that age because it took me till in my thirties <laughs> to get halfway that disciplined. <laughs> yes, he is. He is very different from a lot of the other guys. Well, he's very different from his teammates. Sure. You know, Lando's been accused of not having that, you know, for lack of a better phrase, that assassin's, you know, mm, approach to, sure. to, you know, go right to the right to the limit uh, that the great drivers do. Um, and I think we're going to see great things out of Oscar Piastri that we may not see from Lando unless he can overcome it. And he's his own worst enemy in that regard. He's, I'm not ready. And I'm not doing everything correctly. And sure. Yeah, that's tough. Give yourself a big, yeah. You know, uh, the interesting thing is the way the Formula One races, you know, when someone goes off and, you know, leads the pack 40 seconds away and people say, oh, well, maybe it should be more like NASCAR or maybe more like IndyCar where everybody's bunched up at the end and you got – I don't know. I mean, part of me likes the fact that that technology, everybody's got almost, it's not a level playing field, but sort of supposed to be kind of sort of a level playing field. Right. Yet Max right. has gone 40 seconds ahead of everybody else. It's amazing. Well, yeah, there's a, an interesting business correlation there, I think, between the way NASCAR goes about creating excitement for its races and the way Formula One does it under Liberty Media's um, marketing uh, schemes. Um, Liberty, I think, makes it a bigger event, you know, um, as, as as big and glamorous and spectacular as he can make it. NASCAR more goes for that close competition on the track, even if they have to manufacture it with a late yellow flag. I mean, sure. we're not kidding anybody <laughs> if they don't think that NASCAR yeah. waves a yellow flag when it's convenient. Uh, and I get that. And I love NASCAR. Sure. Uh, you know, I covered it for many, many years before I went to Daytona uh, for some television business. And when you see those guys from the first moment of practice come around in a pack of 16 or 20 Crazy. inches apart with that <laughs> thundering noise from the cars. Yeah. I mean, it just takes your breath away. It, it uh, absolutely does. And no different so, than the football players faking injuries, you know, this new thing where they're all falling down when they need a, when they need a little break. So, man, this is soccer been, players. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Soccer, yeah, soccer, excuse me. So uh, my most important question before we end this, uh, uh, you know, you kind of compared me to Chris Konamaki, I think a minute ago. So we'll use that as a sound bite. No, <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um, what's your daily driver? And it, the more mundane, uh, the more mundane, the better, Bob. <laughs> I drive a, uh, a 2018 BMW X2 oh. uh, with a uh, four-cylinder turbo. <laughs> it's all the car we need. My wife, uh, you know, it's an S, a small SUV, sure. sportier than their X1 or X3 or whatever. Right, right. My, my wife just absolutely loves BMWs, right. so you know, we tend to get those. I'm getting a little tired of it myself. But I, I'm a Mercedes guy have, like you, so I love, uh, yeah. I love Mercedes. I Love to get another Merc. And, you know, there, there's so many great cars. Uh, the trickiest question in the world, if you take it seriously, is what's your favorite car? Right. Um, Tough. In our apartment building here, we get one free parking space. And if I have another car, I have to pay for that space. <laughs> and I'm cheap. So we are a one car family. I don't blame you. Well, when you move to the country and then you'll, you know, hide your, you know, put a motor car in the barn or whatever and you'll have something to right drive, exactly right? well it's certainly been a pleasure having you on the show today <laughs> we really really appreciate you taking time out of your day and uh we'll hopefully uh see you somewhere down the road okay my pleasure Stuart. Take anytime care. take care buying and selling via consignment is safe easy and secure we advertise sell and ship worldwide and if you'd like to know all the advantages of selling your car through consignment the information is available on our website or you can talk to a classic car specialist who can answer all your questions plus you can easily search our inventory online at classicautomall.com and we're back with the classic automall show show number one six seven if you're keeping score at home yeah Bob Varsha is great. He's great. Oh, yeah. my God. Wow. So interesting. The voice and the, I mean, so many things. I didn't want to talk about when the USGP, when IRL and IndyCar split in 1996. And oh, yeah. had the Michigan race. I was thinking why thing. you didn't ask him that. <laughs> <laughs> this is so much inside baseball for somebody who's like me, who right. doesn't know Formula One, but it's really, I'm sure it's fascinating. <laughs> no, I'm serious. But You're flip. right. You guys know a lot of stuff. Well, and, I, and, of I, names. and I'm so broadcasty. I want to. I, I wanted to jump in. Hey, I want to ask right, you about right, this right. and that. What well, kind of microphone do you use? What kind of headset? <laughs> I'm like, 
Oh, great, great guest. And uh, so thankful to be able to have him on. And thanks to our dear friend, Judy Stropus, for getting all these wonderful guests for us. Next week, we have Doc Punch, uh, who is a, another broadcaster, uh, ESPN, uh, and uh, has been around. He's an actual doctor. So oh. uh, he's not just, it's not just that nickname. Like mm-hmm. when people call me, hey, big fella. <laughs> and I'm not a big fella. He's not a boxer. He's not a boxer, Doc. Dr. Punch. Dr. Punch. He's punch drunk. Jerry Punch. Anyway, he'll be on the show next week. Uh, where did you say we uh, sell cars? Where? Wait, where, 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 where? How about Camden, Maine? Ooh. Nederland, Texas. Reading, Pennsylvania. San Francisco, California. Ain't Bethlehem, it. Pennsylvania. Easton, Pennsylvania. Edmond, Oklahoma. Dreshertown, Pennsylvania. Franklin Lakes, New Jersey. Little Falls, New York. Mountain Home, Arkansas. Janesville, yeah. Wisconsin. Coronado, California. Blooming Glen, Pennsylvania. Farmingdale, New York. Levittown, Pennsylvania. Twist. Yeah, pop that tea. Wow. Yeah. And Visalia, California. Mm. So that was eight. Coronado, beautiful place. Oh, my God. Island off yeah. of San Diego. Oh, yeah. Amazing. 26 oh. miles across the sea. Is according it? According to the song. Okay. Of course, uh, <laughs> no different than uh, Catalina, right? Yes. Coronado, Catalina. Well, it's much nicer than Catalina. Oh, it's Coronado. I'm thinking Catalina. No, potato, potato. Coronado is yeah. much nicer than Catalina. Oh, there, I've a been little to both. Well, I've been there to was, both. Now, there was a Pontiac Catalina. Is there a Coronado car? Was there? That's a good question. That is a good question. I think there is a Coronado. I think there is, actually. Podcast at ClassicAutomall.com if you know the answer to that question. So, how about some of the new arrivals in for- How about the new arrivals? How about them? You got little cliff notes over here? Yes, I do. How about the 2000 summer, summer, 2007 Hummer, gosh, I can't speak today, H3, Victory Red over light cashmere. Mm -hmm. I like to say cashmere, cashmere, because cashmere is expensive. Cha-ching. (laughs) <laughs> all right, sound effects are off. Victory red over light cashmere. One owner, <laughs> garage kept, all service records, capable rig, 3.7 liter inline, five cylinder, mm-hmm. and well appointed. And it's affordable. It's a lot of vehicle for the money. Yes. These things are really, really cool. And they're, they didn't hold their value quite as well as I think people thought that they would in the H3, the smaller version mm-hmm. of the Hummer. Uh, but uh, it's certainly more user friendly than the big Hummer that you can't get through the drive through at the Burger King. You can always tell a car enthusiast, especially by the condition of cars that we bring in. This one is a little higher mileage, but you would never know it. No. And, you know, I even made a comment in the about the undercarriage because we had to, you really had to double check the mileage. The yeah. undercarriage is spotless, which it, is amazing. Yeah, it's a, it's amazing to watch people that uh, that like their seats aren't worn on mm-hmm. the edges where they've gotten in and out and it's got a hundred thousand miles right. on it. And you think, how in the world do they? Get in so gingerly. I'm doing a gingerly <laughs> move now for those of you on the podcast world. Yeah. Um, and they don't, and it's not worn. They it, really took care of this this car. It's really did. A truck. Whatever. And I think a fan favorite, uh, uh, a car specialist favorite here at Classic <laughs> Automall has to be our next new arrival, the 1965 Ford Falcon Deluxe Station Wagon. Mm. Everybody fell in love with this little station wagon. Mm-hmm. Uh, silver blue metallic over dark blue and light blue. The long roof, I mean, really, it looks it looks like you said. What did you say? I said it looks like it's floating because yeah. the pillars are silver. So. 289 cubic inch V8, the C4 automatic. Yeah. Uh, great two-stage paint. Two-stage paint, what does that mean? They do it in two stages? It's clear coat, <laughs> clear coat, base coat. Clear coat, base coat, yeah. two-stage, two-stage. So if you say that so people won't know what you're talking about. Right. And it's rust-free. It is a beautiful, uh, we're, we're all surprised it's still here. So if you're in the market for a 65 Falcon station wagon, that's just about perfect. It, it, it speaks to you when you look at it. The stance, mm-hmm. the color, that, that light icy blue just color right. is just a great color on it. How about the uh, 1971 Dodge Challenger RT hardtop? Top banana over black. <laughs> I love those names. That must be yellow. That must be yellow. <laughs> True RT car, 440 cubic inch, six, pa- six pack V8, A727 automatic. Yep. Uh, very nicely restored. It's got some uh, SE, which was another body style dress mm-hmm. to it. Uh, but what a cool car. Yeah, yeah. I think this one was born with a 383, but it's got a 440 yeah. in it now. And it's a beautiful, beautiful car. And, you know, if if the original motor's gone and not to be found, then no harm, no foul. Right. Now, if, you, if you took it out and chunked it and you had the original motor, then I would say eh, it's a little bit of a party foul. Uh, right. I like to see them, if they're original and can stay original, to stay original. And the ones that aren't original because the motor's long gone, then I get that. Then you mm-hmm. can do whatever you want. You can have free reign. And that's my rule. Absolutely. <laughs> like I have anything to do with anything, <laughs> right? Um, how about the uh, 1966 Ford Fairlane 500 hardtop? We were talking about this mm-hmm. car a little while Another ago. Another beauty. Nutmeg over black. Almost a perfect build. Yeah. I mean, I could find a little something here. And, and there. it's like you said, it's such a 
the body style is just a fair lane. So yeah. when you walk by it, you just walk by it. You go, oh, there's another fair mm -hmm. lane. Okay, you know, maybe this one's got a 501 cubic inch stroker, <laughs> <laughs> Tremec manual tranny, uh, Willwood brakes, Morrison mm -hmm. chassis, upgrade. I mean, it's got, it checks all the right boxes yeah. for a resto mod. And I'm sure this was one of those ones that the original motor was either a six cylinder or it was, you know. S small V8. Well, I mean, 1966 is only uh, 50 years ago. Is that right? <laughs> I don't even know. It is. Think. It's almost 60 years uh, ago. It's yeah, almost yeah, 60, yeah, 58 yeah, yeah. years ago. It's just a fair lane and then. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, wow. then you do pop the hood. You pop the hood. Pop the hood and then you'll know what it is. It's amazing. Uh, amazing. <clears throat> how about the 1954 Chevrolet 3100 series pickup? Saddle brown and shoreline beige over brown. Beautifully restored. Very interesting color combination. It's a color combination that you don't see very often in uh, pickup truck world. Brown and tan mm -hmm. uh, for a more simpler version of that color. Um, but this thing's beautifully restored. It's got a 283 cubic inch V8, t turbo hydromatic 350. So it's a, a little bit of a... Uh, some light resto modding yes. going on here. Power yep. front disc brakes and Oakline bed. Oaklined. Mm -hmm. that's, a, that's a term, isn't it, I guess? <laughs> Someone reminded me of those. Remember those banana pops we used to get as a kid on the <laughs> with good humor? So the brown was the stick. Sort of a brown yellow. yellow. The, no, yeah. it was two, two shades of ice cream. Two, oh. two colors. Anyway. Chocolate and banana? Yeah, chocolate and banana. Yeah, oh, exactly. Okay. I don't know where. We got the orange push-ups, you know, oh, okay. stick in the wow. center. Yeah. And you almost choke <laughs> on that stick trying to get that last little bit of orange sherbet. I was from, from a small town. Our, our ice cream truck was the drugstore. <laughs> there was no drive around <laughs> ice cream <laughs> truck. You didn't want to dang, <laughs> dang, 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 yeah. you know? Yeah, right. Oh, they were great. So uh, other new arrival, how about the 1975 Chevrolet Cosworth Vega black over black? This is a survivor car. This is a conundrum car. Mm -hmm. Do you restore it? Do you leave it as it is? I mean, if you leave it as it is, it you know, it's got faults and imperfections because it's original. Mm -hmm. And this one is now, oh my God, I don't even want to do the math on this. It's <laughs> 59 years old. Right. Oh, yeah. No. No, 75, 75, 85, 95, 2005, 49, 15, 49 years old, 49 years old. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Gave it an extra decade. <laughs> Whoops. Um, how about this thing though? What do you do with it though? Yeah. I, I'd, I'd restore it personally. I think I would too. I mean, there's not that many, I don't know how many they made because I, I didn't write this. Yeah. One. It but, depends uh, how much money you have spare, you know, how much yeah. spare change you have. It's like, man, I really like this car. It drives pretty good. I'll just make sure it's safe. Yeah. It runs. And I, but it doesn't have invasive rust. So that's a, that's a positive mm -hmm. to restoring it. When they get into invasive rust, then you start thinking, this is going to be not just stripping the paint off and repainting it, right. redoing the interior. This is going to be structural. This is going to be a lot of stuff. And we, you know, we see cars with invasive rust. I mean, it's not that they're not drivable. They're they're certainly drivable, right. but it's just something to be aware of. Mm -hmm. And it's certainly when you have invasive rust that has started, it doesn't just stop for the hell of it. <laughs> <laughs> it, it keeps invasiving. It never <laughs> sleeps. It does. Rust never sleeps, it's as our cancer. friend Neil Young used to say, yeah. mm -hmm. or does say, or still says, if he still does that song, <laughs> I don't know. Anyway, those are our new arrivals. And I got to give a shout out to my old buddy, Charlie Kuhn, who passed away mm. uh, a couple of weeks ago. Great guy. Worked for Worldwide Auctioneers out of Auburn, Indiana. Charlie was just one of the good guys in the hobby. 63 years young. Um, mm. We saw him at Hershey. Had dinner with him, not this year, but last year. And just found out that he had bad stage four, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Shit, you know, crappy cancer. Mm. And... Uh, just a great car, and he was he did the announcing at Worldwide Auctions, and he it was the senior car specialist there, and just a great guy. So we mm -hmm. wish him and his family blessings, and so sorry that uh, lose another great guy, and just seems to be happening more and more in this daggum hobby, and uh, just life. Right? Yeah, as we grow older, we uh, yeah we can hear more about it. All of our friends grow older. Well, our friend Jay Leno is. Uh, there was just a great interview with him. Uh, you know, he's had a couple of tough years mm -hmm. himself. Uh, not only, you know, did he burn his face with gasoline, mm -hmm. which never sounds like it, it would have a good outcome or not, you'd even survive. Not fun. Uh, and then uh, had a motorcycle accident and blow, broke his leg and tore up his face even more. And then his wife's now got dementia, diagnosed mm -hmm. with dementia. Um, but you know what? He doesn't complain. No. He, he said, you know, he's still grateful for what he has and where he's been. And, you know, he says, okay, it's okay. It's life. Everyone goes through tough things. It's not just me. Yep. You know, we all have things that we deal with that uh, are not, and I'm not trying to depress everybody here. I no. guess I've kind of gone down <laughs> too on late. a depressing <laughs> rabbit hole here. Yeah. Like everybody Bottom crying. line, aging sucks. Yeah. Aging sucks. Live your life. Yeah. But speaking of that, 
A lot of people are going hungry. We wanted to mention Thank something you. coming up this weekend. Yeah, uh, it's it's kind of in conjunction with Phil Abundance, which is a Philadelphia-based food bank. And every year, Preston and Steve on WMMR, a Beasley station, I might add, who right. we were affiliated with, um, they uh, have this. A uh, big food drive right. around Thanksgiving, and then there was this big car show that got attached to it, and there were so many cars showed up that it, now it's broken off into its same entity. As, as Steve knows a lot more about it. In fact, I think you had guests on from it. Yeah, uh, Jeff Walton from the Porsche Club. Yeah, the Reason Toter. Reason Toter Porsche Club. Yeah. They go down there. That's just one of many clubs that goes down yeah. there. Fill a on, trunk. They fill call a, it. Fill a frunk for fill the fill Porsches. <laughs> <laughs> fill a trunk for everybody for else. Everybody else. Yeah. You know, the proletarians. Yeah, right. Yeah. Uh, the plebeians. The uh, plebs. To fill their trunk. But the Porsche people fill their frunk the and uh, f- just bring a ton of food down there. It's, it's unbelievable for a good out. cause, and it's yeah. beautiful, beautiful. Yeah, and they're they're actually having a hundred dollar or a, a ten dollar admission, be first to keep order in it in getting the cars registered. But that money is also going to, to fill abundance. Right, yeah. great. Yeah, and it's at the Wells Fargo Center. It is down Valley. Yeah, on Sunday, uh, seven thirty a.m. to one p.m. Yeah. So luckily, the Eagles play Thursday, so they won't be. Mm-hmm. I'm sure they kind of planned that around. Yeah, that. <laughs> I think they figured that out. And you know, that's Mainline Cars and Coffee that's involved with that as well, too. Mm-hmm. Which we've had some talks about being involved sure. in. They do some great cars and coffee around here. And also, uh, one more shout out to Leno. He's got a new season of Jay Leno's Garage starting up. He had the Gerari that was owned by Bill Hara. Which was oh, a right. Jeep Grand Wagoneer with a Ferrari uh, saw that uh, V12 engine and a far gearbox put into it. <laughs> yeah, and it was called the Gerari, and it was badass. Yeah, it was the coolest thing. I wanted one of those so bad. I mean, I lusted after that thing. I thought that was the coolest thing ever. Uh, and he's got a new video every week on Jay Leno's Garage, and it's about anything that rolls, explodes, or makes noise. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. I wish I could. I could have stolen good one. that. Yeah. yeah. Why didn't we come up with these things? I don't like know. That? Come, come on. on. Guys. Anyway, we will catch you next time. Next week, when we have Doc Punch on the show, that'll be show number 168 on the Classic Auto Mall Show. We'll see you then. You've been listening to the Classic Auto Mall Show with your host, Stuart Howden, executive producer, Steve Safier, produced and engineered by yours truly, J.R. Russ. Available on ClassicAutoMall.com, YouTube, or wherever you get your podcasts. Music, courtesy of the Pat Travers Band. For tour dates, contact, and stuff, visit pattravers.com. Produced by CarSmarts Media. Copyright. All rights reserved.